Hello everyone. Hope you're having a lovely day so far. My name is Juliana in English and Juliana in Español and welcome to the Going Global podcast. Today we're going to be talking with our very first guest, Sofia Arce Flores. Sofia lives in Costa Rica and works at the Monteverde Institute. There, she is one of the instructors and coordinates the University of California Education Abroad Program, where students learn about tropical biology, agroecology, and conservation in Costa Rica. She has an undergraduate degree in agronomic engineering from the University of Costa Rica and a master's of science degree from the University of Georgia in conservation ecology and sustainable development. Her master's thesis included a major focus in applied agriculture and soil ecology. We're honored to have her here today as our very first guest in the Going Global podcast. Welcome, Sofia. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Hello, everyone. And thank you again for having me. It's an honor to be here, too. Of course. Thank you again. We're so excited to speak with you. And I thought we'd first start talking a little bit about your work at the Monteverde Institute. And if you could tell us about what you do, what are your responsibilities, and what does a typical day in your life look like? Yeah, we are in that's where the Monterrey Institute is. We welcome students, mostly college students from the U.S. They come here for a semester to learn about different topics. And a typical day for me, I, I teach the agroecology class for, for this program. There's another program that involves two small colleges, the Mount Holyoke College and the Goucher College. They come here and I teach tropical ecology for that program. We start in the classroom and we have lectures about, let's say, we're going to go visit a coffee farm. Then I teach about coffee, the history of coffee and like what status is on coffee, like worldwide and on a national level. And then here in Monterrey, what's going on with coffee. And then we go and visit a coffee farm and the students get to ask questions to you know, coffee farmers and then try different types of coffee. And then we have some readings assigned for that day. So on, you know, it can be coffee or dairy farms. It can be um, that we go to an organic farm. Anything about cows or if you want to study birds or like reptiles, if you want to do something with plants. So they, they pick any topic that they want. And that's a very interesting part of the project too, because then I'm the main advisor for, so a typical day for me then would be, you know, if a student is doing bird research, so then I go out to the field with, with her or with him, then I do work in the lab too. Like if they're studying roots, this plant, and I know the roots and fungus association. So then it's very interesting in that way that I get to do many different things in one day. So there's, there's not like a typical day, but like, oh yeah, one day I might be doing all these uh, field related stuff and one day working in the lab and one day teaching but it's all very very nice I enjoy it a lot oh I love how hands-on it is that you can get to be out there in the field with your students and doing your work that is incredible uh -huh. and you you told us that you teach agroecology um can you please tell us a little bit more about what that means and what you do you know ecology studies Well, I, I always say this, like, logic is a study of, and eco means, like, how. So it's the, um, the interaction between an organism and its surroundings, you know, like the house environment with, where the organism lives. And agroecology, in this case, is taking the ecology principles to an agricultural production system. Agroecology, for example, instead of doing, like, a monoculture, agroecology promotes that you have different plants of different species in one, you know, in one area, that you're not just um, growing pineapple, but that you're growing pineapples and bananas and beans and corns, and, and it's more small-scale farming than what you see, you know, in, in big plantations here and in other parts of the world. So in agroecology, you try to mimic, um, for the most part, what a natural environment would be, and not just like thousands of hectares of this one plant or... You know, for agroecology too, you um, try to do organic fertilizers instead of synthetic, or you try to do biological control instead of adding uh, pesticides. You know, you try to treat the soil with respect. I don't know, it's many sure. more more friendly with the environment than a regular agricultural system. If for someone that's never heard of agroecology before, how can you best explain the the benefits of agroecology you talked about how it's like monoculture and there's all organic instead of pesticides so can you talk a little bit about like the harms of doing a monoculture agriculture and using pesticides like what are the harmful effects of doing so compared to agroecology here just to put examples in costa rica we have big problems with 
uh, pineapple plantations and banana plantations because it's uh, hectares and hectares. Uh, you know, big corporations, they buy land or rent land and they have, they cut down all the forest and they just have hectares and hectares and hectares of just pineapple growing or just bananas growing. And because it's a monoculture, meaning just like one crop, you know, just like bananas being grown or pineapple being grown, then there aren't any insects, for instance, doing any pollination work or any insects that would come in and eat the insects that are eating the pineapple. So then you have to spray a lot of insecticides or there are or a lot of fungicides. Fungi, uh, fungus is a big problem, for example, in banana plantations. I think they spray, some statistics say that they're spraying like once a week, um, a big uh, biplane comes by and sprays banana plantations with fungicides. And that's because just there's only one crop. If you go to small scale uh, farms, other places, there's you no know, everything is in equilibrium, so you don't have this harmful fungus uh, killing all your your banana plants because there's only a couple of banana plants, and in you know in between banana plants you have beans, you have corn, you have uh, squash, you have other cultures, so it's uh, polyculture. You know, it's not just one. And the same with uh, fertilization. Instead of you know in monocultures, you have you have to spray all the synthetic fertilizers yourself and they're all yeah synthetic and there's a lot of runoff too and that ends up in in the water uh and then goes to the streams and uh to the ocean but in in agriculture principles um you are doing organic uh fertilizer so you do composting and you use the same the same like leftover you know like leaves from the beans or so you collect those and use those to fertilize around a banana plant or uh, like even the compost from your kitchen, because m- many of it, many of the agroecology uh, occurs in like super small scale farming. So, and you know, you're not using synthetic uh, fertilizers or synthetic uh, synthetic um, pesticides, and you're using because it's in a, in a polyculture. There's more insect diversity and more fungal diversity, so then they each, you know, they take care of like one bad fungus is been eaten by a good fungus that is also there in your farm so you don't need to to spray fungicides like i said before agriculture in agroecology you are trying to mimic what would happen in the natural environment and the same with irrigation in in pineapple or banana plantations there's irrigation that happens so you're using a lot of water to keep to keep your pineapples irrigated in in agroecology because because you're using native species or species that that can occur in the area, you don't need to um, to irrigate. So there's a lot less water that's been wasted. Thank you so much for explaining that so well to us. And it sounds like it's really good for the environment, but also for us as humans, you know, not, not to have that many pesticides in our bodies. And it seems to be good all around. And I know that um, I've never learned about this issue until we talk in one of our classes at, at the Global College or when we did... Um, our field trip to a sustainable coffee farm in Costa Rica. So it's really eye-opening to learn how different ways to grow crops really affect the environment and our health. So I just wanted to ask you, what do you feel would be like a good way for students and people to be able to responsibly source their produce and where they get their food so what do you feel we need to do to ensure that we're getting our vegetables and our food from farms that that use agroecological practices yeah i know well in the ideal world if you can grow (laughs) if you could grow on your food or even you know if you even if you have like a a little pot and you grow basil or oregano or something smaller tomatoes now just knowing where your food comes from is triggered that connection that you have with with the land but I know you know I know it's not easy to oh yeah I'm just gonna grow my own food like we you know obviously we don't even grow our own food um, ourselves but if you cannot grow your own food then just know where your food comes from I know organic um, food can be a lot pricier than regular food so it's not realistic to and especially not on a student budget to be like oh yeah I'm just gonna eat organic food but to know um, to try to just to see like local, you know, to buy local, like where, like what is growing around here that I can buy for, you know, from the farmers around here or like try to buy things that are in season. Or um, I know there's like some specials, you know, like sometimes even expensive stores have, you know, like this 
uh, for this week, the bananas are 20% of the, the bananas that have a, some sort of certification, maybe not even organic, but that they do, uh, they pay their employees better, or I know that, are, that is fair trade, or just try as much as possible to, um, yeah, to know where your food is coming from and not just buy anything without thinking about it. I love that. And I think, like you said, it's so important to keep in mind to see where our food is coming from because it makes such a difference, you know, in the environment and our health. Um, so now I wanted to talk a little bit more about your work. So we talked about work in teaching students about the importance of agroecology, but then also um, part of your focus is in soil and the importance of soil. So if you could please define for us what soil is and talk a little bit about its importance in your research, that would be amazing. So I studied soil ecology for my master's and that's, I've been working with soils um, since when my master's was, like you said, at the University of Georgia. And then when we moved back to Costa Rica, yeah, I've done work well in like all our fields in ecology too, but soil is one, one that is very appealing to me. So um, I said before in that, that I gave a couple of weeks ago that soil is not dirt and that's like the first thing that the first take home message like soil is not dirt don't, don't say dirt is not dirt that is I think demeaning <laughs> to call something so important to reduce it to dirt a soil professor used to say dirt is soil where where it's not supposed to be so behind your ears yeah I call it dirt but but if it's doing you know if it's there in the soil doing what it's supposed to be doing it, it's not dirt it's super important and it's the unconsolidated cover of the earth that is made up of minerals and organic material water and air and a common definition for soil is that it it needs to be able to support plant growth too so what you find in the moon or what you would maybe find in other planets uh, we're not calling it soil because it's not able to support plant growth that, that we know of it's just fascinating, the soil, and it can be, um, how do you say it, like uh, iconic if you get to know it. Yes, I was so impressed because I've never really sat down and thought about the importance of soil and of the land in our daily lives. But really, everything we do revolves around soil. It's where, where food comes from, where we stand. So it, it really is a big defining aspect of, of our daily lives. So uh, speaking about that, I just wanted to ask you, like, what was... What made you interested in studying soil ecology? Like what first made you want to go into the field and how did it all begin for you? Agricultural systems have always been interesting to me and because I'm, I'm very into applied sciences and I respect a lot when, you know, when, when some scientists want to study uh, the photosynthetic process of blah, blah, or like this insect, I discovered that. You know, the second leg is a little larger than the first leg or things like that. I, I really think that's amazing, you know, on, on its own. But I, I like uh, applied sciences a lot. So I wanted to do something that was science related, but also that, you know, that involved like a, a sociological aspect to it. So going and working with farmers and combining, you know, like that, uh, farmers and science, that's something that, that always interested me. And... Soils in particular, they're not, well, I, I didn't think they were as uh, catchy as other areas. You know, like you can, you can study, I don't know, like pandas or something. And there's like fundraising for the panda conservation and or fundraising for the jaguar or something. And, and that's all. Yeah, you see a jaguar and you're like, wow, this is it's impressive. Or look at that panda, so cute. But soil is like, how do you sell that? How do you, <laughs> you know, convince people of the importance of soil so I that that was always something that caught my attention and and yes it's very very important and when you get to know it better like when you look under a microscope and you see all the soil organisms or when you realize um, all the carbon that is being sequestered by soil and how important it is now especially now you know the the you know the topics of climate change and uh, carbon emissions then you just get more and more into it. I guess that's um, that's what got me into it. Like just discovering like all the areas that it could involve and how fascinating they all are. Please tell us a little bit about the social side of your work and your work with farmers. So, for example, um, with the students when they're doing their independent um, research, sometimes they come up with their own ideas, and sometimes 
you know, we go and visit a farm and then the farmer says, yeah, right now we're really wondering what is causing these roots to to go bad. Like, we don't know if it's like a nematode or what's going on or if we should, like, what, what we should do about these nematodes. So then, you know, the students can be working on, on that research maybe for like three weeks, maybe a little longer or shorter and, and they can do internships too, they stay longer. But then we are helping them, you know, sometimes like we say, okay, we're going to help this farmer or even independently without the students, but through the Monterrey Day Institute to say like, okay, there's a problem here and they're asking for, for help. And then a student says, okay, I'm going to take on that project. And then we have examples. Well, like some years ago, there was a, some students working on this pair project and there's this um, fungus that like this good fungus that attacks a bad fungus that attacks the coffee. And, and then there was this other fungus uh, so tricoerma is a known fungus to go and, and combat um, the coffee rust, you know, like a fungus that attacks the coffee leaves. And then there's, and so this tricoerma is a well-known fungus. And then there's another new one or newer, newish one, newer than tricoerma that people have been using that is called lecanicillium. So then our students, they went out and compared like lecanicillium versus tricoerma. Again, it's not, you know, like a two-year long study, but at least in the initial stages, they found out that lecanicillium was doing a better job than than tricoerma uh, fighting this this uh, the coffee rust. So then they presented that to the farmers, and the farmers were very excited. And then we left it like that. And then like a month later, I get a call from Mexico, and it's this lab in Mexico, and I had I hadn't even heard of them. I didn't know anything about them, and they said, "Hey, like we just read about your research. We were looking for lecanicillium, and what research has been done." and we just read the study that your students did, and it's very interesting. What else can you tell us about that? So it was so nice because it's not like we publish it. You know, it's an undergrad study, you know, a couple of weeks long. But then there's people out there that are looking for answers, too. And then they contacted us. And the students were already gone. They were back in California, but I, I told them about it. And uh, we kept talking to these people in Mexico that we didn't know, and they were you know, the, the students were excited and these people were excited and they were asking questions about the methodology, like the work, the work in the lab that they did and the work in the field. And it was just great to know that, that regardless of how short or long the project was, um, there were people that were uh, benefiting from it. Oh, you know? That is so interesting to hear. I love that, that the people in Mexico recognized your work in Costa Rica. I love that the science community is so close in that way. And that is so awesome. My Next question is just about students. So students that want to go into ecology and be an ecologist, what would be your advice to them? And what do you wish you'd known before entering the field? Well, like high school students, yes, they're fine. But some, some high school students who come here, they, of course, they come here because their parents send them or something. So they're not <laughs> as excited. But once you're in college and you decide that your study abroad experience is going to be in a tropical forest, then that means that you want to be here. There's so many options. It's so exciting for them. And I, I really appreciate that. Like every time, every semester, it's so refreshing and like such a good reminder of like, wow, this is this is where we live and what. Like monkeys come to my house at least like twice a week. You know, they, they get on the roof of my house. And I, I think sometimes you just like get used to it. But then students remind you that it's, it's so neat <laughs> um, to have that experience. So I think students, usually come with the right mindset and I also remember a student one time that like, we were walking on the trail and talking about different things and she stayed behind a little bit and she's like one second one second I want to take a picture of this and I thought it was an insect or something and it was just a wet leaf like she was from Texas or something so she doesn't get to see like wet leaves that much and she was just taking a picture of a wet leaf but that, was, that was very funny I remember one student she was an international so she was from Cali well an international student in California because she was from China she didn't speak any Spanish you know in her first language obviously it was not English and then she came here and she didn't know any Spanish and they get some Spanish before going to the home state part of the of the program but she was so nervous and then by the time she left she could have like a basic conversation and you know talk about her family and what she was studying and I don't know like the food that she liked so it was fine like students who come here they they, they do great that's incredible and it comes to show like the importance of being immersed in the culture and the language, the differences that it makes. And I also mm-hmm. really like that you mentioned um, about like how things that are normal to you might be like 
so impressive to someone that doesn't live in Costa Rica. Like, Mm -hmm. that makes sense. We so get so used to, like, where we live, we don't get to see, like, the natural wonders um, of everyday life. So, um, speaking to that, um, you were also an international student in the USA, right, in Georgia. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience there? And if you have, like, you already told us some anecdotes about your students, um, would you have any advice to any other international students that would want to live in Costa Rica or, or anywhere else in general? So, yeah, I went to, to the University of Georgia for two years for my master's degree in conservation, ecology, and sustainable development. I, I loved it. I loved the whole experience. And you're there with people that also want to pursue grad studies in something that is so, you know, like it's the same thing that you like, you know, it's, so you have similar interests. So you have you find a lot of people that want to like, share like the same ideas that you share. And that's great. And one thing that, that I remember caught my attention when I got there was that, what is it, that like the access to stuff that you have <laughs> in universities in the, in the U.S. at least, you know, that you have all the equipment, you know, the nicest equipment or as a grad student, you have the access to drive the, the university car to go to your field study. And there's like the super modern equipment in the lab that you can use and just like, yeah, access to stuff in general and was something that was very um, contrasting to here, at least when I was studying here too many years ago. It wasn't, you don't have access to as much equipment or at least not as easily. Like if you wanted to use a spectrophotometer, you had to go and sign up and they were like, okay, come Tuesday from three to five and use it. And there at uh, UGA, I remember, I could just go in and use it if it was available right there. But also that's, that's something funny when students come here too and they want to, let's say they want to measure the percent of light that is coming in through the canopy. Um, you know, the percent of sunlight that is coming in the forest. And if we don't have the super special equipment to measure that, then we've done things. We've had to get creative and we do like a roll of toilet paper and we, you know, we aim it to the sky and then they calculate like, okay, I think it's like 20% here. And then they go different places and 15% here and 50% and 20%. And because it's just like one person doing the measurement, you know, it's not super accurate, but it's them doing it themselves. So then they can do statistical analysis with that thing that they they came up with themselves or like to measure the percent of salt in a mangrove tree you know you, you can have this um, little equipment that tells you yeah the percent of salt in this leaf or you can you can like irrigate a leaf and all the water all the excess water you put it in a bucket and then when you evaporate the water then you can measure the amount of salt so it, it makes you get creative too with the things that you have for things that are not being published you know just for like just things that you're going to do for three weeks or a month or so. But it, it also um, challenges your creativity of how to measure things. <laughs> of course. Oh, that's so great. And it's such an important skill to have to adapt to all those different um, like challenges. You know, if you don't have the technology available, then finding a creative way to solve that. Like that is so perfect. It kind of reminds me in high school, of course, at such a smaller scale. But when we had like physics experiments, we didn't have the fancy equipment to do them. So we'd also have to find ways around them and do the math and and find different ways to to have a similar experience. But I think at the end of the day it's even better that way. I guess you get to you get to try all of these new things that you wouldn't have thought of in the first place if you hadn't, you know. Uh-huh. So that yeah. is so wonderful. Is there like one like one piece of advice you want someone to know that's going to be an international student, say next semester? Let's see. I would just say try to soak it all in and come with an open mind. And well, something that that we've told our students to come for yeah for like eleven weeks or so is to if they can to keep uh, like a journal, you know, of things what they're thinking or things that they liked or disliked because then by the end of those 11 weeks you can you can go back and read and then you know you can read in one year two years five years you can read what you what you thought of you know that day you know like what really caught your attention at one time or in the forest what was something that you really liked or like oh this is such a big difference between Costa Rica and where I'm from or um I don't know like keeping a, a journal is something that I think it's important for you know, to look back to in in time. I agree with that so much. And that's kind of, um, even with this podcast, what we want to create um, for our 
program in our university just have a record and be able to look back because I do feel like especially like studying abroad you get all of these experiences that you're soaking up in the moment but it's like you said it's really nice to be able to look in the future back and see what you did what you were thinking I think it's such a such an important gift to yourself so I love that advice thank you so much and to close up our the last couple of questions are going to be about your experience as a woman in STEM. So um, I know during your talk in Olivia's class, you talked a little bit about the experiences you've had and your colleagues have had um, being uh, fem females in the science world. So you mentioned that sometimes um, there's the experiencing of imposter syndrome or not being taken seriously and being held at a higher standard than your male colleagues. So for all the um, students that are women that would like to go into STEM, what is your advice to them? Um, what are some strategies you use to be able to work in the field? My advice for female students who want to pursue a career in the STEM field is to please go ahead and do it. We need more representation. Women, I guess, because of you know the society and our upbringing, Many times we lack the confidence that our male colleagues have, or we um, might not be um, as aggressive in the sense that we might not put ourselves out there as much as our male colleagues. But and I actually remember a TED talk about students who were studying like coding, you know, like to learning to code, and then when when the male students had a problem, they would come to a professor and say, "Hey." There's something wrong with the program. Uh, it's not working. I cannot do it. And But then female students would say, hey, there's something wrong with me. I don't know why I cannot figure out this program. And that's just to show that uh, sometimes we doubt ourselves a lot more. But, um, you know, it's good to like second guess yourself sometimes, but then don't don't doubt that you're doing a good job and you're there for a reason. And also speak up if you if you feel that there's some mansplaining going on or like man interrupting and support other women, too, in your field. And you'll be fine. Yes, please study something in the STEM field. <laughs> for it's like I feel like culturally it's harder for for women to be assertive because we're raised a certain way. We are supposed to not be in the way and not ask too many questions and um, be independent. When I became a mom, that's, yeah, you question yourself a lot more because you're not as productive as you once were. So to me, it was very telling when, when I had my first baby and then like even during the pregnancy because you get a little bit more tired and you don't want to stay up late and, I don't know, for this study abroad program, sometimes you are expected to stay up late with students because it's very intense. You know, it's like you're compacting a semester in 11 weeks. So it's not uh, unheard of, you know, that you stay until one in the morning, two in the morning with students. But like once you are a mom, you don't want to do that. <laughs> or you're working in a lab. I remember one time you're working in a lab with with the student, it was a great study and I was very into it. But then we went over, we stayed longer than it should. Like one experiment didn't go as we thought. So then we had to stay longer and I had the babysitter taking care of my baby and I and I was breastfeeding. So I started, you know, it was time for me to either pump or leave. And the student kept talking and I felt like I had to stay with her. But I like I wasn't even paying that much attention anymore because I was just thinking, OK, it's, it's like hurting. It's like physically hurting. I need to either pump, pump, you know, and, or, or just leave. But And that's not just being a woman in science, but a woman in general with, in any job. Yeah, it's a different it's a different thing when you already have kids. But in the end, you, you manage to somehow. And luckily for me, I'm in a good work environment that even, you know, my boss is very understanding and like a family person too. So, and they've been through that too themselves and, you know, and other colleagues too. So it's been good, I think. Uh, like you're harder on yourself than than mm -hmm. anyone else. <laughs> so just take it easy and enjoy the ride and enjoy your time to be, like, accept help when you need it. Yeah, and you're doing fine. I think that's really good advice to accept help when you need it because... Were you mentioning before, it's like, I feel like culturally it's it's harder for for women to be assertive because we're raised a certain way. We are supposed to, like not be in the way and not ask too many questions and um, be independent. So I really like um, 
asking help when needed is so crucial just in general and of course later on if you if you go into motherhood of course you're going to need more more help than you used to before and that's completely fine because that's how it goes you know kids are raised in community and your work is in community so it makes sense i love seeing uh, during your talk um the sweet pictures of you with your kids um working outside in the field like that's so cool that you get to take them with you sometimes if you could um tell us a little bit about how that works when you go in the field with your kids uh yes it's great that i have the opportunity to take them especially when i'm uh you know nursing i, I didn't want to leave my my babies when i was nursing and go on a field trip you know for two weeks so it's good that i have that opportunity that my my boss said like okay yeah it's okay we can go with the students and we can go on this a biological station that is very like rustic you know you don't have a lot of facilities and you have to like sleep on the floor with a mattress but like even at that i'm i just thought okay my th this is when i just had one one kid and i was like okay like even this is better than me being away from my daughter for two weeks and and it was great too because i have a supportive husband who who took off of his work so that he can come with me and stay with the baby when I was uh, also like at hikes or giving talks or like on a night hike or doing group projects uh, in the field. So um, it's good to have that flexibility. And yeah, and it's good for students too. A lot of the, the study abroad uh, students who come here, they are female. You know, we have sometimes out of 35 students, we have, I don't know, like 24 females and the rest are male. So it's the majority are female. So it's good for them to see that you can be a woman in science or like you can be a woman and still uh, go out and do field work, which is something I think that I didn't have as much when I was in, in college. Yeah, many of my professors were male. And then when I started seeing more female professors or like in other courses, when, when I would see a female lecture, and I especially liked it and I didn't know why. And then I realized, oh, it's because I can relate. You know, it's a woman there doing something professional in a field that I'm interested in. And yeah, like she, you know, like I, I can understand more um, where she came from than uh, you know, a male professor. But so it's good. It's good that I'm able to take my kids to the field. But also, of course, it has a challenge. It's challenges. You know, it's one thing to show like, to look back and look at the picture of like, oh yeah, the girls, yeah, like one of them, I was nursing her and the other one was like wrapped around my leg, oh so cute. But then at the moment, it can be distracting too. <laughs> you know, she wanted to go get ice cream, but there wasn't even a store, you know, for miles around. And I don't know. So <laughs> sometimes, yeah, the picture looks great or like, oh yeah, look, I'm doing my computer work and my, my baby's uh, asleep attached to my breast. Oh, that is so cute. But then it's not comfortable. Sometimes, you know, you just, your back hurts and you're just writing with one hand and with the other one, you're holding her head or I don't know, they, they pee on you. <laughs> so it's not, it's not all like as romantic as it seems sometimes, but, and it's good to have that perspective, you know, that it's not like motherhood in general. It's not like, oh, oh the ideal, the ideal scenario, but it has a lot of challenges. But in the end, you know, the good things are better than the bad things. <laughs> Yes. Oh, I love that. Thank you so much for sharing. And I think it's so important to, yes, acknowledge the challenges and also all the positives and just give a realistic overview of what it's really like because that's how that's how life is. It's, it's real. It has challenges. It has positive aspects. It's how it goes. And um, I can really resonate with what you said about seeing yourself rep represented. I think it's really important to see um people that you look up to that look like you or that um, mm -hmm. have similar interests as you. And um, our program, um, I'm a freshman this year, so our class is mostly females too. It's um, we're 12, it's 12 of us and two of them are guys and the rest of us are girls. So it's, it's really important to see people like you and people like Olivia who is teaching our um, ecology class, just being scientists out in the world because I know many of us would want to aspire to do similar things. So I agree. It's so important and I'm so glad you mentioned it. Anything else that you'd like to say that you feel like we've missed? I just think that the part about me being a study of, you know, an international student in UJ, yeah, I talked about how in the States there was a lot more access to stuff, to equipment and stuff, but like a similarity, a, a nice similarity that I 
that I saw was also that the quality of education was very similar. You know, like sometimes we think in Latin American countries, I don't know why we have this thought like, oh yeah, the States, like look at the education or like in European countries. And and one, that was one thing that I saw too when I went to the States, like, oh no, it's great. Yeah, like you might have, you know, 20 computers in the computer lab and we only had five, but we still had them. And the professors were just as good. You know, like I, I really like and here in Costa Rica, the public university, you know, like, or the public universities are really good and they have really good reputations. So that's one thing that I tell Costa Rican college students too. I like, don't think that just because the professors come from the U.S. Or, or like from Europe that they know a lot more than your professors here in Costa Rica. Yeah, education is good quality here. Yeah, uh, we were learning in our classes about the quality of education in Costa Rica. And it's, it's so impressive to hear, you know, all of the of the talented professionals that come out of the universities and that they're public. Like that is so important. It's something here the state struggles with because even though we have public universities, they're really expensive. So it's it's so encouraging to hear that there are countries like Costa Rica where you can go get your education for free and it still be really high quality. So that's, I'm so glad you brought that point up. Mm -hmm. So now our last question is one that we plan to ask to um, all of our guests in the podcast. Since our college is the Global College of LIU, the goal of the program is to try to learn about the world's issues and how to make the world a better place. So we thought a good question to ask you is, what do you think are some actions that we can take today to make the world a better place to live in? Well, there are, there are so many things that you can fight for. And I, yeah, like so many nice things that you can focus your energy in. And yeah, this is something that I've told my students in the past that there's, you know, like many, many people who care about about the environment and they say okay I'm going to yeah like try to know where my food comes from or like try to eat less meat or to use a car less or to use less water if you care about animals to go to a spay neuter clinic and volunteer I don't know I just think there's so many good things that that you can do that you have to see you have to pick one there's like you know more than a hundred things that in my community that I could be involved with but I cannot do a hundred and much less on a volunteer basis because I also need to, you know, to make money and, you know, go on my every day life and eat. So I would say just pick, pick one thing that, that you're interested in and try to do it. Just like at least one thing or like one step at a time, do something that, that makes you feel that you're leaving a better world for future generations. It's really encouraging to hear how many options there are out there. Um, that you can contribute, make your contribution, and help make the world a better place. But you're so right in that we are humans and we can't do a hundred things at once. So it, like you said, it's so important to just pick one or pick a few that you can really be like committed to. And there's, like you said, there's a plethora of options out there for us, which is really encouraging. Thank you so much for coming here today and for speaking with me. I really appreciate your time. This was so wonderful. I feel like I learned so much. So thank you so much, Sophie. Well, thank you, and I hope it goes well with the rest of your classes and everything. And thank you for thank you to be and for honoring me with this like with interviewing me. I feel I feel very important now that you interviewed me. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, you are. You really are. Thank you so much for listening to our Going Global podcast. If you have any ideas for any upcoming episodes, make sure to DM our Instagram at LIU Global. Thank you so much again, and see you next time.